Hello, Bill Molino here with Bill's History World, and you're about to watch a lecture by Scott Mingus, famous author and historian. Some of the audio may not be the best. It is the best that I could do. I hope you enjoy it, and thank you for watching. Rappahannock River. They're going to move northwest to Culpeper. Uh, as they're moving, 
hoping they are going to disguise their movements of the Union Army commander, a guy named Joseph Hooker, cannot tell that the Confederates are on the march. They are going to have giant bonfires at night. At daylight, they're marching in left and right to create massive amounts of dust clouds so Union balloonists can't figure out what's going on on Confederate lines. It goes on for days. By the time they had done two-thirds of Lee's armies on the road, and the entire United States Army of the Potomac is still sitting in their trenches on the other side of the Rappahannock River. On June 9th, there's going to be a battle fought at Greeny Station near Culpeper. That's really the first time the United States Army has an idea that maybe Lee is not planning on renewing hostilities near the Rappahannock River. Maybe he's going somewhere else. And nobody's really sure where he's going. Now, the Army of the Potomac is still sitting in Fredericksburg. There's no way in the world, if the Confederates are moving north to Pennsylvania, which some people in Washington believe, there's no way in the world the Union Army can get to Pennsylvania before Robert E. Lee can. Can't win that race. So, their second thought is we need to really make sure Lee's not turning around and is going to attack Baltimore or Washington from the north. That's what he does in 1864 with Jim Worley who's going to loop into Maryland, come down into Washington from the north on um, try to attack. Of course, that attack in July of 1864 is stopped at Fort Stevens. That's what they fear in 1863 that Lee wants to do. And so they got to guard all the roads. Well, here in Pennsylvania, the governor, Republican Andrew Craig Curtin from Belfast, is absolutely convinced that they're going to Harrisburg. His spies, his intelligence network back in 1862 and told him they were coming to Harrisburg. He certainly believes the same is true now. He's got a telegraph office right in his capital, right in his office, and he's got an inner room where he actually has a telegraph line coming directly into the governor's office. It's the only governor that I can find in the entire Civil War that has his own private telegraph line running into his office. And it keeps him abreast of what's happening throughout the, the idea. He keeps hammering on Washington. They're coming to Pennsylvania. In fact, he sends the assistant, former Assistant Secretary of War, Colonel Thomas Scott, who was his personal advisor, the former, like I said, uh, Assistant Secretary of War and Vice President of the Pennsylvania Railroad. He sends them to Washington to plead with Lincoln personally. The rebels are coming to Pennsylvania. And you gotta be able to stop them. How's the US government respond? They sent one general and no men to defend Pennsylvania. The general comes and arrives, finds there's 57 United States regular soldiers in all of this part of the Commonwealth to defend the state, and there are 70,000 Confederates potentially on the road to Pennsylvania, and 57 US regulars to stop them. There's no other troops other than Home Guard units, Every little town, including York, has a little militia set up. Back here in downtown York, up and down the street and back of us, are men drilling with broomsticks. Up and down the street for hours with broomsticks. They don't have guns, you know, but they're drilling at least, trying to find out what's going on, uh, and at least trying to prepare to defend York if they have to. The Major General stands dry as couch. He's actually a distant relative of my wife, believe it or not. General Couch shows up. Uh, and comes to Harrisburg and realizes the governor's dead serious. We got a problem with potential invasion. On June 12th, it becomes painfully clear to Pennsylvania that we're in the crosshairs. Why? Because the Confederate Army now abandons all thought and pretense that they're going to Baltimore or Washington. They cross into the Shenandoah Valley. And if you know where the Shenandoah, anybody know where the Shenandoah Valley dumps? Where does it end? Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. We call it the Cumberland Valley here in Pennsylvania, but it is the Shenandoah Valley, just in geological formation. It stops at Dillsburg, at Harrisburg, just at the gates of Harrisburg. So any Confederate army in the Shenandoah Valley is clearly coming to Pennsylvania. And so everybody's now well aware of this is what the problem is. And on the next day, it becomes very, very clear at the Second Battle of Winchester, the second largest battle of the Gettysburg Campaign, 87th Pennsylvania from York in Adams County, it's mostly from York County, is part of the defenses uh, at 2nd Winchester, three day battle. They are going to surrender. They're going to lose more than 65 to 70% of their men, uh, mostly prisoners of war. They're going to actually, believe it or not, walk from Winchester, Virginia to York, Pennsylvania. They're going to walk here to try to get home. Uh, and the Army's almost, the division is almost all but destroyed. 
destroy it, it'll never fight again. It's a division. General Milroy uh, commanded them this disgrace. It takes him a year to get a job back. He never gets his original job back. What this does, though, is it opens the doors of Pennsylvania. These 8,000 guys that are Winchester's job was to stop any Confederate raiders from heading to Pennsylvania, i.e. Jeff Stewart, the 1,000 cavalrymen in 1862. This job is to repeat, is to stop a repeat of that on uh, 1863. What they never anticipate is the entire Confederate army coming to Pennsylvania. They just assume it's gonna be Jeff Stewart and a bunch of guys on a horse. No, 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 all 70,000 Confederates in the Army of Northern Virginia are now on the road to Pennsylvania. Very clear. And Lincoln, of course, now has to do something about that. Some people in Washington are still not convinced that the target is Pennsylvania. The president asked for 100,000 volunteers. Why? Because the U.S. Army's not getting here. So we don't have a standing National Guard in any of these states along the border. So we need to raise troops. We need to raise them now. He calls for 100,000 volunteers, 25,000 from Ohio, including my great-great-grandfather, who comes and joins one of the Ohio uh, National Guard units that are suddenly being raised. Um, he raises 25,000 from West Virginia, including another ancestor of mine, joins the emergency militia in West Virginia, and he calls for 50,000 in Pennsylvania, which the governor, are we back to the governor? There's Governor Curtin. He wants 50,000 men. He issues that broadside, which actually is posted here in York. The enemy is approaching. Not the Navy going to Columbus, Ohio. The Navy going to Wheeling. The Navy going to Baltimore. No, no, no. He says the enemy is approaching. Is approaching Harrisburg. They're coming to Pennsylvania. He needs men to sign up. He wants 50,000. That's the quota that Lincoln has set. He's only going to get 7,000 volunteers, only 75 of which are from York County. So he calls for 50,000 men. We got 75 volunteers from this area that, and almost all of them are from southwestern New York County. Now, this is the river defenses back in 1863. You can see some familiar things here. Of course, there's the turnpike, US Route 30 slash 462. Uh, there's the bridge of Wrightsville. There's the Susquehanna River, of course. This is the railroad. Uh, Canada Hanover Junction up from Baltimore, ran up North Elmira, New York. Uh, Northern Central Railway. At Hanover Junction, had a spur that ran through Jefferson and Hanover, New Oxford, over to Gettysburg. And of course, you have the Pennsylvania Railroad running down to Columbia, Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad running to Philly, and the Cumberland Valley Railroad running down to Hagerstown, Maryland. Robert E. Lee needs to break apart all those railroads. He's going to succeed uh, in doing that to almost all of this. The U.S. government, though, with far less troops than they think they're going to have. We want 50,000 guys, I got 7,000. So he's gonna put 1,000 of those guys in York County, 800 of them between Wrightsville and York Haven, and the remaining guys are gonna be sent to Hanover Junction. He's gonna send a regiment of 743 guys over to Gettysburg, and put another full regiment of about 900 guys in, Wright, or, uh, in Columbia, and then the rest of the guys are gonna be in Harrisburg. The Republican governor of Pennsylvania has to do something he doesn't wanna do swallows his pride, sends telegrams to the Democratic governors of New Jersey and New York who have existing state militia, National Guard units that are always been there, uh, they're permanent, and he says, please send your troops to rescue Pennsylvania. And they do, in you know, a credible display of bipartisanship, 1863 style. Within hours, train loads of troops are leaving both New Jersey and New York bound for Harrisburg. Uh, so the Democrats and Republicans come to a budget agreement, and off they go. <laughs> a lot easier back then, I guess. All right, so here's the world's longest covered bridge in Wrightsville. Uh, technically the second longest covered bridge ever built on Earth. The original one, just upstream, 500 yards or so, uh, had been knocked down by ice in the 1830s, rebuilt downstream, slightly shorter bridge, um, so technically, this is the second longest bridge ever built on, uh, out of wood, covered bridge on Earth. But the important thing about this bridge is it's the only bridge from Harrisburg south to Conewago, Maryland. If you want to cross the Susquehanna River in 1863, there is a board at York Haven. That's why they need to guard York Haven. And there's a bunch of ferry boats, McCall's Ferry, etc. But nobody's operating ferries, and all those ferry boats 
were sent to the east side of the river. So the only way to cross the Susquehanna River in 1863 in York County is the bridge in Wrightsville. And the only way to cross it in Harrisburg is the two bridges side by side, the Camelback Covered Bridge and the Cumberland Valley Railroad, it's Iron Bridge, and then cross over the river. But this bridge becomes really important in both the Union plans and the Confederate plans. As we go back here, again, pointing out from Harrisburg South to that's it. So if you want to protect Harrisburg, you're the Union commander. By all means, protect that bridge crossing there. Slow them down here. Slow them down there as best you can. You're not going to, you're going to save this stuff. You can at least slow them down. But nobody's crossing the river. That is why General Couch is sitting in Harrisburg. He has orders. No armed Confederate may cross the Susquehanna River. That's a real simple order. That's why he panics almost when he arrives with 57 guys. And an army of 70,000 coming and I gotta keep them off the river. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what you gotta do, General Couch. All right, so this emergency militia, 7,000 guys are being hastily trained, as mentioned. They're gonna send one regiment to York County, they're gonna send another regiment to Columbia, and send a third regiment to Gettysburg. The other 4,000 guys stay in Harrisburg, and they guard those bridges along with 10,000 New Yorkers and about 1,000 boys from New Jersey who all show up. All right, June 15th through the 19th, here comes the infantry and artillery, uh, or sorry, the cavalry, and the artillery starting into Pennsylvania. This is a supply rate. Remember I say that Robert E. Lee has many goals for the invasion, one of which is supplies. Lee's men will come into the western side of Franklin County, they'll cross Cove Mountain into a uh, big Cove area, they will raid McConnellsburg, they will take cattle, food, supplies, back. By the time the Gettysburg campaign's over, the Confederate Army has brought 67,000 head of cows out of Pennsylvania. There will be York County cattle eaten by the Confederate Army as late as the spring of 1865. So Robert E. Lee can prolong the Civil War for almost two years based on the food supplies he gathers in Pennsylvania. We always think Gettysburg's a massive failure for Lee, and it is militarily wise and strategically, but it prolongs the war because his coming to Pennsylvania and Maryland enables him to feed his army. And that's what this first raid is. The 15th to the 19th, that's a supply raid, and a very successful one at that. 19th to 22nd, back they come to raid the eastern part of Franklin County. Again, taking stuff out. By that point in time, the state militia is on its way. The train comes through York County, uh, has crossed the bridge of Red Columbia, went through Wrightsville, steamed to York, turned to York, head south, went to Hanover Junction, turned west of Hanover Junction went through New Oxford and Hanover, and now has arrived at Gettysburg. They're gonna send 100 of the best soldiers out to stop the Confederates. They can't find 100 guys that have ever fired a gun before. That's a problem. Uh, but they're at least gonna give it a shot. Uh, so they're out there trying to, and on Sunday night, June 21st, they're, June 21st, the first small battle of Pennsylvania soil occurs. And what that does is panic everybody. If you're a Marylander, in the path of Robert E. Lee's oncoming army. If you're from Franklin or Fulton or Cumberland counties, you now know the rebels are on their way. We don't know how many refugees come through York. All we know is there's traffic jams that stretch from Wrightsville to the west side of York. We think we have traffic problems now on 30. Before 62, we've never had stacked up all the way in the river. At least I know, unless it's short of an accident. But back then, it's stacked up right in front of us here, Market Street, you know, at the time the turnpike. You know, you've got those. What they do record, believe it or not, in Harrisburg at the toll bridge in Harrisburg, they record whether you're white or black for some weird reason. I don't know why, but they did. 1,800 uh, black people and over 4,000 white people cross that bridge, almost all of them refugees. Oh, by the way, it's not free. And so you are paying cross that bridge. Here's the bridge of Wrightsville. This is the only known photograph taken. This is Columbia. This is Wrightsville. Here's the canal. There's the bridge. This little structure here is a towpath for the canal. Uh, you actually dammed up the river out of here, and they'll uh, use horse team, uh, mule teams to um, walk them up here with a long tow rope, and they'll drag the canal boats across. And college boys, 
this from over here in Lancaster County, a friend of the Marshall of Dillersville, where my little son actually did his master's thesis on referring to rights of bridge, which I would have book for this stuff. Uh, Millersville uh, college students come back across the bridge to Wrightsville and they're constructing. But here's what the calls for. About a buck for a freight riding on a horse, 30 cents for a carriage by a, by a horse team, 16 and a half cents for a horse and rider, or six cents for a pedestrian. Oh, by the way, they define pedestrian as anything that crosses the bridge. You got a herd of cows, each one's a pedestrian. <laughs> you got 10 horses you're escorting? Uh, okay, well, okay. You got your kids riding the horses too to help protect them? Well, that's 16 and a half cents for every one of them. And keep in mind, this is not the first time Fort Countyans have started moving across the river. It's not the first time refugees from Franklin County and Adams County have come in here. Happened in 62 in September. Happened again in October when Jeff Stewart went through. For a lot of these guys, for the third time, they've had to cross the bridge with their entire flocks of sheep, with their entire herds of horses, with their entire earthly possessions in many cases. It's getting expensive at that point in time. A lot of people are getting tired of this because the rebels never come. They never come. The college boys do a great job of digging entrenchments. They're joined by railroad workers, townspeople from Wrightsville. This is 462, that's the world's largest covered bridge. This is Crates Creek, that's the railroad tracks uh, coming in on the Northern Central Railway. Just get an idea of what it might look like. On June 22nd through the 25th, here's the problem. Here comes the infantry. It's no longer a cavalry raid for horses. This is now a direct raid on Harrisburg for the most powerful Confederate army in the country. Robert E. Lee, eight victories, no losses, and maybe a tie in Antietam, to his credit. He's never lost a battle, folks. You got an undefeated army coming into your territory, and the only thing you got to stop them is a state militia with three days of training, most of them will never fire a gun in their life. Do you have any clue how terrifying that would have been to the people of Pennsylvania? We got these folks running amok. They're coming everywhere. And then Richard Yule, Robert E. Lee's uh, command of the second corps, gets these orders. If Harrisburg comes within your name, this is Harrisburg. There's those two twin bridges, Railroad Bridge, Camelback Bridge. This, of course, is uh, uh, Cumberland County. This is Harrisburg. If Harrisburg comes within your means, capture it. So now we know. If Harrisburg comes within your means, go get it. But the goal's not Harrisburg. The goal's to draw the Union Army into Pennsylvania and feed it. That's what Robert E. Lee's number one job is. If you get Harrisburg while you're doing this, terrific. But the goal is to wipe the Union Army out in Pennsylvania. So he gives orders to Joe Borley. That's the guy. Go to York, destroy the Northern Central Railway. Remember, supplies and the uh, Union's uh, uh, communications routes, destroy the bridge, and march to Dillsburg. How many of you are aware that Robert E. Lee intended to fight the Battle of Gettysburg at Dillsburg? You guys know that? Read the Confederate orders very carefully, and you'll see that Dillsburg was the concentration point for the widely scattered Army of Northern Virginia until the Yankee Army moved into Pennsylvania a lot faster than Robert E. Lee ever thought they would do. And so he changed it to Heidelsburg and Cashtown and Gettysburg. Before that, we would be uh, here in Fort County touring the Dillsburg National Military Park. <laughs> and we have a little more York County history to talk about here, Jonathan, Richard, Adam. <laughs> We've been celebrating or maybe mourning, depending on who won, the Battle of Dillsburg. That's what Lee's supposed to do. That's the goal. Come here. So Friday, June 26, one foot three inches of rain will fall. Horrible day. Absolutely miserable weather. We can relate to that, right? You know, we've had a ton of rain this year. Well, back in 1863, they had a miserable year as well. And they had a drought as well in the late fall, much like there was this year. The Confederates have sprung out on two roads, Route 11, Route 30, and they're heading towards those two sets of bridges. Two thirds of the Confederate Army going for the two bridges at Harrisburg, one third of the Confederate forces in Pennsylvania, heading east through Gettysburg, New York, uh, heading towards Wrightsville, the bridge that is here. On uh, the afternoon of June 22nd, uh, 26th, the Confederates take Gettysburg. How many of you knew the Confederate Army had Gettysburg, Pennsylvania a week before the battle? They're running, they have the town, they chase 
on the state militia. They will sleep where the giant food mart is today on Route 30 uh, on, the, on the west side of Gettysburg. That is the Confederate campsite after taking Gettysburg. They take the town. They have the high ground. You know, the beloved high ground everybody talks about, Cemetery Hill. The Confederate cavalry are on Cemetery Hill on June 26th. They've got it. They got Cemetery Ridge. They could have Cobbsville if they wanted it. They have the town of Gettysburg. They've got everything. Town surrenders. Good Orla meets with the city council, ransoms Gettysburg for supplies. They load a US flag. This is 462. Most of these buildings are still there. That's the building where Abraham Lincoln will sleep the night before he does the Gettysburg Address. That's Willis House. Uh, this is by our fellow New Yorker, Bradley Schmell. Uh, lives over on Eastern Boulevard. Saturday, June 27th, we don't want Gettysburg. <coughs> we want the bridges. And so the Confederates abandoned Gettysburg, started marching into this area, and now it's going to get really nasty for York County. As the Confederates start moving into this area, farmers in York County start responding by making strange hand gestures. They're waving yellow pieces of paper. They're crying, mostly in broken English, because most of them are German farmers. They're crying, peace, peace. Why are they doing that? Because con men from New York City have come to York County in the days before the Confederates bill. And they tell the farmers of York County, for only $1. We know you didn't vote for Lincoln. Manheim Township, for example, West Manheim Township, 174 votes for the Slave owning Kentucky Vice President of the United States, John Breckinridge, two votes for Abraham Lincoln. York County does not like Abraham Lincoln with a passion, particularly Southern York County. 22 votes in Fedora's Township versus 400 for the opponents. It's just miserable the way they think about Republicans in the southern part of the county. And that's where the common hit. They go to all these German farmers and say, we know you didn't vote for Lincoln, we know you don't support the war. And we know you're a friend of the South. So when the Confederates arrive, show them the secret password of peace, peace. Show them the secret hand signals. Show them the yellow piece of paper, your membership card, your knights in the golden circle, and they'll know you didn't vote for Lincoln. Throughout York County, people buy the tickets. Throughout Cumberland County, Adams County, these con men go everywhere. They're con men from New York City. They're not dudes with the Confederates. They just know the politics of South Central Pennsylvania. They will openly brag in the New York newspapers uh, in late July that we sold thousands of tickets in Pennsylvania, most notably in Pedoras and North Pedoras Township. Richard, which county is that in? North County. They openly brag in the New York newspapers that they sell more tickets in North County than anywhere. Of course they do. So, when the Confederates do arrive at those farms, they're waving the tickets, they're making the hand gestures, and the Confederates knock them out of their hands, and they go out in the fields, and they take all the cows and horses. Why? Because those guys are trusting in those tickets. They believe the con them, and they said, the Confederates won't bother you because you didn't vote for Lincoln. It's all a farce. The Confederates don't know anything about that. As two of them later writes, these things were all new to us. The purchases of these mysteries have been badly sold. That house right there, some of you recognize, that's on East Berlin Road at the intersection of South Salem Church Road right back there. That's Charles Spangler Farm. Uh, he buys the ticket, and he loses four horses, folks, by the way. And I love this quote by Joe Trundle, who's another farm along East Berlin Road. We gave the old Dutch and Pennsylvania fits, our army left the mark everywhere. It went, horses, cows, sheep, hogs, chickens, spring houses, suffered alike. They cried, peace, peace, most beautifully, wherever we went. <coughs> peace, peace, again, is the password of the Knights of the Golden Circle. That's this supposed Confederate sympathy group that did not exist at the continent of New York City. It didn't exist in Pennsylvania, at least this part of Pennsylvania. Why is the white Confederate cavalry going to raid Hanover Junction? This is Hanover Junction in November of 1863. With everything going to pot, York's leaders decide we got a problem. Now, a young York businessman triggers everything like right now on his own, goes out west to Abbottstown, finds the Confederate Army, and decides to negotiate with them on his own to save his factory and to save the town of York's women and children, so he tells them. Same stunt he's pulled in on 1862 when he rides down to Virginia and finds his college roommate, Robert E. Lee's son, which 
triggers, again, a repeat in 1863. This isn't new, folks. None of this stuff's new. And so he rides out, negotiates with the Confederates, rides back into town, tells the Chief Dirkus of the town, David Small, here's what I did. I surrendered York. And Chief Dirkus is like, on whose authority to do that? You can't do that. Only city council and I can. So the Chief Burgess grabs a US military officer, George Pei, um, and uh, gets a couple other guys. And they start heading guys to the city council by partisan. And they head back out. They go to Farmers. And in that house, York will formally surrender uh, that house. But all the Confederates are still on the march. They're heading there anyway. Now, Jim Worley starts planning in his own mind. Remember his orders. Seize, uh, burn the bridge, and march to Dillsburg. Well, the state militia has been so horrible so far, not defending Gettysburg, not defending York, not defending Hanover, that he decides, you know, maybe I can be the next Jeff Davis. Maybe I can end this little war. Joe Borley decides on his own, I'm going to grab the bridge of Wrightsville, I'm going to seize a thousand horses in Lancaster County. I'm going to mount the Louisiana Tigers on them. And I'm going to take Harrisburg myself. Against orders. His orders to go to Dillsburg. But this guy's never been real big on uh, orders. Rodney Lee eventually fires him a year later in 1865. Well, actually, early 65. Uh, basically, for insubordination, among many other things. But that's his goal. He's going to do all this. So now it's Sunday, June 28th, they come into York County, courtesy of the York County History Center Act. Here is uh, a Louis Miller print. This is uh, in 462 Market Street, with Gettysburg way out there. Here they are coming into downtown York. Here's General Jim Early, the second command, John Gordon. There's the town council uh, of York, sitting there waiting. They're coming in with the pioneers, the guys who were there job and break down any barricades that workers may have put up in the roads. One little old lady, I don't know who she may be, let's say, let's take her just for the sake of it. She sees them, she screams and faints, like God would come to bury us. Because workers have no clue what's going to happen. They're going to burn our town. They're going to burn our people. Are they going to kill us? What's going to happen here in York County? Uh, and they see these guys with pickaxes and shovels leading the way. What else are they supposed to think? They come into town. Another Louis Miller print, courtesy of North County History Center, showing the Confederates loving their uh, U.S. flag on this massive 85 foot flagpole. Yeah, this is uh, Center Square right here. That's East Market, or uh, West Market Street right there. History Center beyond, somewhere down beyond those trees. Here we are. 6 p.m., uh, General Gordon, the second commander of Early's men, is going to attack Wrightsville. Here's these entrenchments that those college boys and railroad men had built in and around Wrightsville. They're going to order that bridge destroyed. And interesting, the Confederates wanted to burn the bridge, now they want to save the bridge. The Yankees wanted to save the bridge, now they got to burn it. So you can see both sides have just turned around in their objectives and what they're trying to do. So now the state militia, oh, very smartly, you'll often read that the state militia burns the Wrightsville Bridge. No, they don't. They order four civilians who are stockholders in the bridge to burn it. That way, the army didn't burn the bridge. And to this day, the Lancaster County's politicians, notably their Congress people, are still trying to get money back from the US government for the destruction of the bridge. Every single congressman from Lancaster County since the Civil War has gotten up on the floor of Congress at one point in their, in their, their term in office and asked the government for money. It's all ceremony, they're never going to get a dime. But again, that shows how smart the government was. We don't have to pay the bill. Uh, you guys burned your own bridge. Uh, so, and there it is. This is the Wrightsville, uh, this is uh, Wrightsville side. That's Wrightsville right there. This is how it hills. Here is the uh, Columbia side. There's the uh, canal right here. All the water's been taken out of the canal. Uh, the canal boats now sit in the river. You can see guys in the canal trying to build their fences. Here comes, and oh, by the way, down here, are 57 free black men. Not in uniform, but they're getting guns by the US Army. These guys here are the patients of the US Army hospital in New York, wearing their characteristic white blue uniforms of an invalid. Uh, and here come the state militia, three days of training, marching out of uh, the bridge. 
When Schiff's bridge catches on fire, Confederates form a bucket brigade. This is the Wrightsville site again. This is Wrightsville Front Street. Uh, that's the old canal, uh, now a park. Uh, they're going to form a bucket brigade and they're going to save the town of Wrightsville from burning down. Monday, June 29th, look at Gettysburg. The U.S. Army is now arrived in Pennsylvania. But the Confederates are still heading to Dillsburg. Here's Major James Downing. He's come into Ward County. He's, his job is to secure Dillsburg to get it ready for the Confederate occupation and concentration. Why? You got guys here from Chambersburg, you guys in Carlisle, you got guys here. Where's a good place for them all to meet? Dillsburg. That's where Lee wants to go. The Union Army has changed his plans. Now they're in Pennsylvania four or five days before he thought they were ever going to get here. This is Mary Jane Rowe Walt. She's my hero. As Confederates labor to save the town uh, by that bucket brigade, she tells Confederate General John Gordon, uh, stop by in the morning, uh, you know, bridge now burned down. Stop by in the morning, I'll feed you. He thinks she's a spy. Because when he's here in York, he's been given a uh, bouquet of red roses with the complete plans of defenses and rights to go on them. He thinks, good, this is great. It is written in a quote unquote, a woman's flowery handwriting. I found my spot. York County doesn't like like it, I found my spot. She's not a spy, she's a Lincoln supporter. She mouths off to a Confederate general that she's just invited to breakfast. I just tell you that with my assent and approval, my husband's a soldier in the Union Army, and my constant prayer to heavens at our cause cause of Lincoln, may triumph and the Union be saved. Have you ever heard of a to an enemy general in your kitchen? How gutsy. John Gordon could have had a shot on the spot. Instead, he later writes, and I quote, other than my sainted mother and my beloved wife, the heroine of Susquehanna is the bravest woman in America. A York County woman, Mary J. Will Walt, the bravest woman in that's the bridge after it's been burned down. General Early is going to ranch in York. This is where see, he wants a hundred thousand. Whoa, he wants a hundred thousand bucks. He's not going to get it. There we go. He's going to get twenty-eight thousand six hundred ten dollars of the actual receipt left with York on that day. Uh, Twenty years later, he'll ask York for the rest of the money, or he'll turn your fair city into a collection agency. Never does that. Tuesday, June 30th, rebels are now starting to leave York County. Battle's starting to, uh, everybody's starting to assemble at Gettysburg. Here's John Buford bringing the Army of Potomac's cavalry into play. And here's Jeb Stewart heading to Dillsburg. Why? He doesn't know that he's supposed to go here. He's still on the original plan go to York, find Jubal Early, go to Dover, and go to Dillsburg. He never gets the update. And so here he comes. But well, before Jim Worley leaves on the morning of June 30, he writes this nasty grant to the city of York, basically saying, you know, I could have burned your town down. I should have burned your down, town down. What you guys did to me down south, to my people of the south, it's almost criminal. I could have rolled by the torch. But you know, we're gentlemen, we don't do that. We don't do the things the Yankees do. It's kind of a sarcastic letter. Read it sometimes. I think the York County History Center has a copy of it somewhere here. I don't think it's in the collection. All right, almost done. Jeff Stewart arrives in Hanover the same day, almost dies, jumps over, escorts over a ditch, managed to save himself. From that point, a year later, he won't save himself, he'll die at the old tavern in Virginia. But he should have died in Hanover, or at least been captured. But in Hanover, he managed to escape, again, on his way to Dillsburg. He thinks that he's going to talk out this captured Union wagon train throughout York County, present it to Robert E. Lee as a gesture of good faith. So saving that wagon train becomes paramount in his mind. He's going to ride to Jefferson and try to save the train by riding through Jefferson. What he does in the way, though, he grabs three, three southwestern New York counties off of West Manhattan Township uh, and kidnaps them as guides, forces them to lead his troops to Dillsburg. Uh, and then when he gets to Dillsburg, he lets them go and steals their horses. Makes them walk from Dillsburg to Hanover. Not a pleasant walk, I'm sure. The Feds are going to have a rest break at Jefferson. They're going to raid all the stores. Every single store, they're grabbing all the stuff. Why do they want so much cavern and want so much uh, uh, cloth? Because it reinforces the breeches of their pants. Makes them softer to ride the uh, saddles, less hemorrhoids, etc. So cloth becomes 
firearms and military targets around York County, as well as York County cigars. I just love that. <laughs> Even then, the cigar industry was already burgeoning here in the county. It takes six hours for the Confederates to go through York New Salem, just a 17 mile long column at the peak. They had to pause at this farm. This is right in back of uh, runners on uh, the intersection of South Salem Church Road and Route 30. The Confederates talk about, I love this quote. Variable browsing land this is York County that we moved through on horseback. The Johnson River prowls is spreading as out of the The sour crowd, the Conestogas, that's three uh, oasis. The red red barns, the guttural voices, the strange faces. Moving here from Cleveland, I echo a lot of that. <laughs> there are a lot of big barns in York County. They're almost all red, you know, at least they all used to be at a point in time. And by the way, you guys do cook well. I think you can that. Really well. So we're just going to ride to Dover. This, believe it or not, is the Tom Station in Dover at the intersection of Canal uh, Road and uh, uh, Main Street. July 1st, out of Gettysburg begins. Oh, there's Jeff going to Dillsburg. Of course, that's where he's supposed to go. Um, he's not out lost. He's just going where he's supposed to go. Um, and then I finally leave Dover and wave Dillsburg. Then I cross over this bridge that no longer exists. This photograph was taken in the 1960s or so. I love this final quote. You said to see the Dutch people in York County turning out water and milk and bread and butter and apple butter for variety of reps. I was quite surprised at the tone of feeling in that part of the state. Two or three instances I found people who seemed really glad to see us in scores of houses. They had refreshments at the door for the soldiers. People bought because people really didn't know what to think. I don't think there have been at all signs of every building that set on fire at last as we raced through. Nor would a great many have been surprised that we had concluded the business by massacring the women and children. I'll submit to you something we don't talk about very often. That's the mindset of the people of York County. Yeah, we may have surrendered to the Confederates. So that, that's debatable. What term you want to use. But the one thing that's not debatable is the terror. People are scared to death. We have no clue what this enemy army is going to do. There have been rumors they're going to burn a town. Do they ever burn a town? Yes. A year later, they burned Chambersburg to the ground. Half the buildings of Chambersburg are destroyed in July 1864. These people in York County are terrorized. These tickets aren't working, folks. We might now know that tickets don't work. Everybody's telling us, fleeing in New York, fleeing into Dillsburg. Come in. Tickets aren't working. We don't know what else to do. Rebels come to our farm, let's put milk and cookies out for them. Maybe they won't burn our farms to the ground. And I love this quote. By the way, his dad's a United States Senator, Louis Wigfall, later governor of Texas. You know, and this is his kid, 18, you know, Tristan, you're 18, this will be soon shortly. 18-year-old right. kid writes this fascinating letter about York County as being terrorized, frightened of death. And that's the thing we need to remember. We look at this through 21st century eyes. We need to look at this through the eyes of the people who are here. These people were scared to death. They had no clue what was going to happen to them. Who arrives at Dillsburg? And of course, the Dillsburg learns there's no rebels here. There's nobody here. And for the first time, here's maybe I need to go to Carlisle. There were Confederates in Carlisle. If you look there, he still doesn't know he's supposed to be where? Gettysburg. There's no, this is July 1st, folks. They've been fighting all day on July 1st. What's he doing on July 1st? Riding through Warrington and Washington Townships on their way to Carroll Township. And so they head to Dillsburg, nobody there, I'm going to go to Carlisle. Meanwhile, Battle of Gettysburg's raging again, one out of every seven Confederates. All of Jubilee, at least 6,600 guys, all of uh, Jeff Stewart's 4,500 guys, plus another 300 under James Mountain. There is York County, one out of every seven are in York County before the battle occurs. July 2nd, of course, final day the Confederates are in York County. They're marching from Dillsburg down through Clear Spring, following today's Route 11, uh, Route 15. At York Springs, the guys early, uh, Stewart's men will reunite at York Springs, and they're going to head down and fight a battle in Hunterstown. And finally, at 4 o'clock on July 2nd, Jeff Stewart, a connected to this loop, finally arrives at Gettysburg a day and a half after the battle has already begun. Why? Because he goes to Dillsburg and he fights a battle in Hanover 
is not as fast as Earl, and then he makes a mistake of going to Carlisle, and finally learns to file out and he did Gettysburg. Finally, I'm back in York County. 850 York Counties filed damage claims. 1,125 horses taken out of the county, 60 mules. $271,688.97 in personal property loss. If you ever want to read these damage claims, they're on the website of the York County History Center. I transcribe them, donated them, my Excel master file to the York County History Center. But boy, the implications of the better way of York County are still being felt today. Today, still going on. Several farmers are bankrupted. I know families in York County that are still bitter at Google Early and Jeff Stewart. Why? Because they've lived in poverty for five generations. Some of them still live on the same farms. They've never had their wealth back that they had before the Civil War. And they're deeply resentful of that. John Bumper, Dillsburg, dies of a heart attack, right? And when Confederates come into his orchard, he has developed the name. Uh, we talked about the York Imperial Apple. He's developed his own apple called the uh, Mumper Vanderveer apple, well, the second famous apple in York County. Rebels burn down his trees from firewood. They eat all of his uh, apples. He dies of a heart attack. You know where the Horn Farm is out in eastern York County? The guy who lives there goes in the barn and kills himself. He's bankrupt. He hangs himself in that barn that burned down a few years ago. And of course, the most telling thing in York County is the people who supported the Confederates, the people who supported the Unionists, don't like each other. And I'll submit to you, 160 years later, some of that still lingers. Where there are folks who supported Lincoln, there are folks who didn't support Lincoln, and families still don't like each other uh, in some areas. But it's a horrible time. It's a time that one York resident says never to be forgotten, never to be forgotten. And I'll submit to you, as a society, we can't do that. We need to remember how important this area was, remember our history, and remember the terror that once spread through York County. On behalf of my publisher, South Speedy LLC, I want to thank the members of the South Central Pennsylvania Geological Society, thank you, York County History Center, uh, for your kindness, and thank you so much, everybody who's attended today's presentation. Have a great day. Um, Major Gilmore in 64, when he was in Timonium, Towson, yep. did York County freak out over that? Yes, in 1864, there was a Confederate raid called the uh, Gilmore uh, Johnson raid uh, that went uh, along the route of the Western Maryland Railroad. They were heading towards uh, Point Lookout to free Confederate prisoners of war. At the same time, the Confederate Army, Jim Orley, now commanding a big chunk of the Army, comes towards York County. They're going to fight a battle of monocracy. U.S. government does not respond by sending troops to Pennsylvania. They're going to send troops to Maryland at the point in time. 600 York Countyans grab their own guns, form an impromptu infantry regiment, and they march to the Maryland border. York Countyans, not with uniforms, just guns and guts, and they're going down to protect York County in case somebody comes up the railroad from here. So yeah, that, that was the, the response to the Johnson Gilmore raid. Exactly. They figured they're going to shoot some horses and if they try to come close. They never do. But it just shows again. 1862, panic in York because the rebels get within six miles of Gettysburg. They plan to burn the bridge in 1862. 1863, they do come into Pennsylvania. 1864, they come back. Yeah, I mean, we live on the border. Of course, three straight summers, York, Adams, Franklin County, definitely were worried about the Anyone else? Yes? How valid is the story about the note that was handed to ah. the little? <laughs> yeah, backstory on that. A uh, little girl, Gordon, in various talks, says 10 to 12 years old, supposedly hands John Gordon a bouquet of red roses somewhere right out here on West Market Street and gives him, when he looks at this bouquet of flowers, he finds a piece of paper in it, unfolds it, and he says it has a complete defense of the right stuff with names, number of troops, where they are, et cetera. He says when he got to Wrightsville that he went up on a high hill somewhere. You know, some people think he went up to St. Louis Park. I'm not sure he went that far. 
but he went somewhere where he could see Wright's point. And he says, uh, it, and I quote, not a detail of that little note was incorrect. Okay, so he says, everything the spike said was there. Do I believe John Gordon's story? Yeah, kind of, because uh, research by the York County History Center's late and lamented uh, Lila Foreman Shaw uh, over the years revealed the name of the girl, Mary Ann Small, lived right down the street here, uh, was not part of the small family that ran the town. Uh, she was yet another branch of the small family. Uh, but yeah, so I think it happened, sure. Anyway. I will tell you John Gordon has a history of exaggerating. Uh, doesn't always tell the truth in all of his writings, but that's what I tend to believe. I mean, why would you make that up? That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't make him feel much better. Back to the thing, the reason I believe it, to answer your question, the reason I believe it, you're a military officer, you have complete plans of the enemy forces, and you dawdle and write school for an hour before you launch an attack. You know? If you don't have that note, why do you tell people you do? Because it makes him look stupid. I got this note, and it took me an hour to still take the town? You know, you're not going to make something like that up. You know, he's going to figure out I had the note. You know, and he probably shouldn't have told people. Because the story, as military historians to this day will tell you that John Gordon dragged his feet at Gettysburg, dragged his feet at Wrightsville. You know, he was just dotted throughout this campaign. So yeah, I think it was real. Yeah, any other questions? Right. Yeah. Um, to whom did the militia units report? Were they report to the Adjutant General? Ah, good question. To whom did the uh, militia units report? They reported directly to the Department of the Susquehanna, General Couch. So Darius Couch uh, is the commander of all the state militia. And so he reports to the U.S. War Department in Washington. Henry Howitz, who is the uh, U.S. Uh, commander in chief, general in chief. Now, they have a dotted line relationship to Governor Curtin and the Adjutant General of Pennsylvania because these are state militia paid for by Pennsylvania. But the final say goes to General Couch. But there is this twin relationship. Hard line to Washington, dotted line to Harrisburg. Well, it's just, I have a brief answer. Yeah. I have ancestors who supposedly helped dig trenches out in Bedford County. Yeah. To protect against the Confederate Jacob Sinks trench? What? Jacob Sinks Yeah, trench. well, I think the Colonel in front of Jacob Higgins. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and Higgins is up here too, yeah. yeah. The Chicken Raiders. The, supposedly, nobody knows the name of these civilians that helped dig the trenches. Right. I'm trying to find if there'd be any documentation. Ah, great question. Uh, the Home Guard units never reported to anybody. They reported to the mayors and to the councils of the town. Uh, Higgins' men were never mustered into the Union Army, nor were Jacob Sinks, who was the next one over. So there, there are no muster rolls for them. Uh, they never got paid, they never got uniforms uh, from that. They were Home Guardsmen. Uh, as such, any roles would have been kept by the communities in which they were raised. Uh, I don't think we even here in York County have the names 